wondering how to fall completely in love with the people and things that surround you at home? I've spent the last 15 years studying how and where families thrive and what relational and house characteristics ignite us with that homey feeling. On this podcast, we uncover how our brains process the people we live with and the houses we live in so we can confidently create our homes to be wonder-filled connection magnets. Ready to give up the decision fatigue, comparison hives, overwhelm ulcers, and confusion chaos? You are in the right place. I'm your host, Carly Thornock. Welcome to Becoming Home. What's up, homies? I am so glad that you're here. Today's topic is beauty and simplicity and how they play together. And I have the world's leader on this. I'm convinced. Today, we're going to be talking to Tyler Swain. He is an artist. He is a scholar and a hero. <laughs> but he takes the my favorite part about what Tyler does, and he'll tell you more, and I will, I'm sure I'll fangirl more. But my favorite part of what he does is he takes everyday objects and creates a moment for them, a visual moment where they are the center of attention. And the detail that he gives to his paintings is so rich and so exquisite and so like breathtaking, it just stops you in your tracks. And so I'm excited for you to get to know Tyler, both for his art, which is beautiful, and for his story, because it's so compelling. Welcome, Tyler. So glad that you're here. Thank you. That was quite an introduction. <laughs> I'm so glad to have you here. Pretty cool. I was reading over your bio, actually, just before this call, and you never told me you've like exhibited in Japan. Tell me about this Japan ah, exhibition. Okay, that's a fun thing to kind of sneak in my bio. Uh, yeah, it was this crazy thing. Uh, somehow there was an arrangement with a university in Japan. It was funded by the Japanese government somehow. And this, maybe it wasn't even a university. I can't even remember. It was all in Japanese. So it's hard to know. Like, <laughs> You're you just know, like, yes. <laughs> too. I, I had to have like, a there help me out with some stuff. But anyway, it was, it was either a university or just an organization working with a university. One of those. They got government funding to bring artists from all over the world in person for a big exhibition uh in this japanese art gallery it was it was like right outside of tokyo so yeah and it was the the deal was it was uh for artists that had graduated with a fine art degree and were currently working in the field the idea is to continue an academic discussion like the kind of discussion and critique you'd have maybe in uh, an undergraduate or graduate program but for artists that were no longer in a strict education setting. Does that make sense? Yeah, like you're out of academia, practicing in your field, but you had that background so you could partake in sort of this colloquium. What did they say? What was the feedback? Oh, it was great. It was great. So uh, we, it was myself and a sculptor, uh, both from Utah State University. Uh, The way we got connected to it was one of the teachers, the uh, 3D, I don't know what the title is, three-dimensional sculpting, whatever, professor at Utah State, uh, is Japanese. He's from Japan. Oh, cool. And so he knew all these guys over there, and he had reached out to them and said, hey, this looks like a cool thing you guys do. Would you be interested in having people from the United States, particularly from northern Utah, uh, where I work, come? And so he kind of got that whole ball rolling. So, yeah, we went, uh, we set up the show, and then we had like a week to just play in Tokyo and just oh, man. enjoy. And it was great because I was with this professor who, of course, was fluent in Japanese. So I didn't have to like order food or anything or know anything that was going on ever. He just took us around and showed us what was cool. We had a fantastic time. Then we came back for like the big meet and greet. Uh, we had a whole bunch of it, like in our group, there was a couple from Japan. There's a couple from, uh, you know, the kind of close by Asian countries. Uh, and then we also had, I think, someone from, was it Sweden? Oh, and cool. Australia and, oh, I forget. Where was Sound of Music? What was that setting? Austria. Austria. So Australia and Austria. That's right. Awesome. Uh, so, yeah, and it was great. So not everyone spoke English, of course. Not everyone spoke any like one language like there was multiple translators so it was cool I, I got to like talk about my artwork and i had a translator like that's so cool you know, like there's a crowd of people you know and it was like, translating it in japanese 
um, as I was describing my paintings. And it was just cool. Just one of those opportunities where like, that's kind of a once in a lifetime thing. And so anyway. That's so neat. And how yeah. cool to let like the art speak for you. I find it so fascinating. The art is one of those mediums that really can speak for itself. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Like I'm, I'm usually kind of turned off by when I go to a, like a museum or an art show and the painting is not just immediately understood. Oh, you know I mean? like if, really? Yeah, I think a, a good work of art, everything you need to know about the painting or sculptor or sculpture should be contained in the painting. This is my philosophy. I think I think it's a good philosophy, though. Uh, <laughs> I'm liking it. <laughs> like, Keep going. You know, I'm the artist. So it's my job to make a compelling painting and whatever information you need about that painting should be contained in the painting. And if you have to have a plaque next to it to explain what it means, then it's not a very good painting. Because mm. it needs further, you know, it's like, oh, well, this, let me tell you why it's relevant or why this is beautiful. You shouldn't have to say, it should just be there, you know? So, so I'm kind of of two minds. Like, I really, I'm interested to hear about artwork and what was the inspiration behind it, but I don't think it's necessarily vital most of the time. If it's a good it's piece true. I think you're totally right. And if you think about like the Monets, I'll, I mean, do we know the story of the lilies? Do we know the story? Maybe there's probably a book somewhere we could find out about it, but all we know is like, that's so compelling. That's so beautiful. I'm gravitating toward this for some sole reason that's expressed through the art medium. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. So like maybe the story is supplemental and interesting. It's like kind of the gee whiz factor, like, oh, Cool. The G is back there. That's you know, so good. Kind of, oh, cool. Like, back to it about it. But yeah, you don't need to read a plaque to walk in and see a Monet in person and know that it's like an amazing, breathtaking thing. You know, that it just takes your breath away because of what it is. Same with like music. You know, you can have instrumental music or music with lyrics too, any, any medium really. But yeah, all that you need to know about that music should be contained in the song you should you like it or you don't like it and then if if there's supplemental uh information that comes that's just like maybe icing on the cake that's like kind of cool M might help you have a different perspective but I think that's a great philosophy. And I actually think when it comes to our houses, maybe this is different because homes is art. I haven't really explored this yet on the podcast, so I'd love your input about this. If we're looking at our homes as art, is that still true? Do you think if it's a place for you and mostly just you, does it matter if it makes sense to the rest of the world in your opinion? Or do you feel like homes, I, maybe it's a two facing, like homes are also forward facing. What are your thoughts about homes as art with that, that perspective in mind? So we have a new home in Hiram, Utah. That's where I live currently. And uh, it was so fun to, to have a space finally, because we've been renting for like years and finally we're like, we're going to buy a house i'm gonna be like a legit adult <laughs> own my house you know so we got this house and we just loved it because it is it's like its own work of art you can customize each wall each corner it's kind of like an evolving artwork in and of itself and yeah ultimately what matters is do you like it is it something that's meaningful to you a home is such an interesting place and maybe this just leads right into what we're going to be talking about with custom art like when you're creating custom art for people and it's for a specific audience, for a specific person. I think the abstract is a little bit easier to venture into because if they know the meaning, that's kind of all that matters. And if you can portray the meaning to that, it's like a relationship between you and a client and a client in this piece of art. Um, so you can be a little bit more abstract. Like I could put a picture of whatever on my wall and have it mean something to me. And if nobody else in the world gets it, like who cares? Cause it's my house. <laughs> However, if you're forward facing, putting your work in, work in a gallery or wanting to impact people as a movement, then it's so imperative that your communication is clear. And this is something that I actually struggle with. My graduate professor was always like, Carly, nobody knows your brain. You got to use more words, use more words. Tell us what's going on with you. So I'm comp I feel compelled toward your skill in creating this story within an art. Agree or disagree? What do you think? Both. I guess I, I agree and disagree to a point that, uh, okay. So first of all, like what you said, if you like it, that's all that matters. You know, if it speaks to you, who cares what other people think or what other people even get from it? You know, maybe someone looks at it and they're like, Oh, that's kind of a weird painting. Or to me, that reminds me of a spring day. And you're like, well, to me, it means something else, but 
I'm means the, the heartache of the winter, whatever. <laughs> yeah, whatever. It's like, if you like it, then it's valid for you. That's fine. This question of needing to like be very clear about the motive behind your art contained in your art. Sometimes I guess that is important. Some people make art that's like really, um, it's got a narrative that's like important. It's political or it's mm. a narrative that like they really want to communicate a story. So they've got to be really careful about how they paint that painting or or write that story down or something. They've got to include a lot of clues to to get their story across. But a lot of the time it's way more vague. I like the stuff that's more vague personally, where I just paint something that I find beautiful for whatever reason. And I put it out there and I'm just thrilled when someone else also finds it beautiful and for maybe a completely different reason, but their reason is just as valid as mine, you know, cause it's an individual thing. So when you're talking about everything you need to know about the painting being contained in the painting, it's almost like a release of control about the interpretation of the painting, but putting your intention out into the world to be picked up with whoever is vibing in the same way. Yeah. Yeah. That's well said. I think that's right. That release of control, especially as an artist, probably is hard. Is it hard for you? I love it, personally. It's what gets your fuel. <laughs> I do, because I just, sometimes I get feedback for, you know, if a painting sells in a gallery, I mostly sell my work through galleries, but sometimes on my own too. But sometimes the gallery owners will like give me a little insight into some of the uh, buyers or like their stories. And so like just an example that came to mind, I, I painted a painting of an apple hanging on a branch. I've done a, a lot of those because I think they're, it's just a beautiful subject and interesting. I didn't have anything specific in mind when I painted it, just that I really liked the colors and I liked the shapes and, you know, just on like a, a very technical level, it was a beautiful thing to paint. But then the gallery owners, they got a hold of me and said, we told you and a uh, cool story. It was this lady that uh, her mom, I believe, I hope I get the story right, but it, it, you know, you get the idea. I think it was her mom that had uh, had this same kind of apple tree uh, for like all of her life outside of her house. And it was like really meaningful, like a meaningful memory that that invoked of her mother because that tree had been cut down recently. Oh. And then to walk into the gallery and you see like that same variety of apple and it reminded her of her mother and, you know, the the relationship she had with her mother, it took on a whole new meaning for her. And she bought the painting, you know, right there thinking like, this speaks to me personally. I didn't intend that, but the fact that she got that is just so interesting. And it, it doesn't like box in the painting for one particular narrative. It just, it allows, like you say, like the release of control. I just send it out into the world and see what becomes of it. And and if I like it, chances are there's going to be someone else that likes it. Maybe for a different reason, but, you know, likely be vibing on the same level, like you said. Totally. I think that's the strongest even energetic pull we can even put out is something that we're deeply inspired by and that we think is beautiful. We love, we're grateful for. That usually attracts the people that are grateful for those same things. And then we find these random people in the most random places that believe the same things we do, that appreciate beauty in the same ways we do. It's almost just like a little kiss of fate. I don't know. I love it. That's yeah. so beautiful. Okay. After all that, tell everybody what you do and what inspires you. Um, and we just dived right in, but I want people to really specifically understand what makes you tick and kind of the genre, the, the verbal picture of the genre of your art. I grew up loving art. I was never really super good at it though. I just really liked it. And so I was in art lessons. My parents were really cool about, you know, like giving us kids uh, an outlet for things that we seem to be interested in. Uh, so they put me in art lessons when I was eight years old. And uh, so I started exploring different mediums and different techniques and stuff at a young age. Never like super great stuff, in my opinion, um, but just kind of developed a love for it over the years. And as I got into high school, I got way more into music than art. So, I, you know, I kind of ended up doing both things quite a bit, but more music than art. Uh, so it wasn't really until college that I got like, I, I really honed in that I wanted to be like a professional fine artist, oil painter. Cause I had, I had an amazing teacher and 
he was my 2D design teacher at Snow College. His name is Ron Richmond. Your listeners should definitely check out his work as well. Super beautiful stuff at the end of the semester. And he was like teaching 2D design. It wasn't even like his paintings that I, I didn't even know that he was a painter until like the last week of the semester. Um, I was taking this class and we're like making books and like designing unique like design elements within this like handmade book we were doing. Anyway, at the end of the semester, he said, okay, so anyone who would like to come see my art studio to see what kind of paintings I do, uh, I'm doing like a field trip. So let me know if you want to go. So I went and I was so amazing. Blew me away completely seeing the kind of paintings he was doing. Simple, elegant, just beautiful paintings. A lot of them were still life. Things like, I mentioned apples earlier that I like to paint those. He painted a lot of apples and he do like fabric, just like a, a piece of fabric draped over a chair or something. Mm -hmm. And it was just like really like simple stuff. I'd never thought like a, a piece of fabric could be interesting or beautiful until I saw the way he painted it. And I thought, oh my goodness, the way he like gives life to these simple things and makes it like unforgettable is this, that's what I want to do. After that, my course became pretty clear for me that I wanted to become an artist to figure out how to make paintings that compel people to like, you know, just like see something in a new a new interesting way, bring beauty in it in like a, a new way into people's lives. That's so compelling. I like that a lot. And can we mention the specific kind of music you love? Because I'm a fellow lover of this type of music. Oh, well, I love so many types. So I, I'm a drummer. So I love that's heavy. right. That's what I'm fishing for. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love like Led Zeppelin's uh, uh, lots of little, like Rush, Pink Floyd, all the classics, good stuff. Uh, a lot of good bands coming out too like uh black keys and um let's see what's the other rival sons mm -hmm. i have to check them out i'm a drum oh, line girl the oh, drum set are? always oh, confused me so i oh, know I'm the opposite. <laughs> drum, drum line is way too rigid for me i, I like just on the drum set and rocking out i feel like there's a lot more application to learning the drum set than like the snare drum in a line however <laughs> there's a snare involved in both places there's a venn diagram right of crossover <laughs> so it's all it's all grooving drumming it's just are you more rigid or are you more uh free form i guess free form that's true and now your art is so simple and refined and beautiful and mine is kind of more like Put yeah. the house together. So maybe we're more crisscrossy. Who knows? Fun. Okay. So you have an episode on BYU TV is artful that you yeah. shared with me. And it's so fun. Everyone should go watch it, first of all. Second of all, what I love from that was this connection of the spiritual to the like physical, simple everyday. Can you speak to that? Kind of going back to my experience with the work of Ron Richmond. Um, it's easier to paint it than explain it, right? <laughs> <I'm a painter. laughs> but uh, I guess to, to try to put it into words, it's it, it was really just amazing to me to see an ordinary thing be elevated to a new status of beauty. And when you see enough of that kind of art, I think it kind of starts to rewire the brain a little bit. At least it did for me. Uh, and I've heard other people respond similarly, but that you know you see something painted there's something about that like hand painted careful attention to detail uh intentional making of an object that's long and tedious to do something about that process if you do it right makes people look at it and they're just like wow this is a new way of looking at it like you you put so much attention to detail i think that it's a form of spirituality to start recognizing beauty. Beauty and spirituality are kind of like the same to me. I totally agree. Maybe not like the, like a perfect synonym, but they're really like closely related. It feels so, the same in my body. Yeah, you feel like that. It's like food for the soul. It's like soul yep. food. You know, mm -hmm. when when you hear like a, a song that's just like so well done and it's like, or you watch a musician perform that it just blows you away and it like elevates the soul in a way that you can't really put into words other than it's just like it it like takes your soul to a higher realm you know uh artwork of course when you see something it doesn't have to be like 
a spiritual theme, but just something portrayed beautifully, then it does the same thing. It takes your soul to a higher level. So yeah, that's the kind of work I'm interested in stuff that kind of inspires a little, a little speck of beauty in their life that wasn't there before. It's almost like it makes me want to slow down looking, watching your art, looking at your art. I feel like you have to watch your art because you're afraid it's going to move. It feels so lifelike. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> but um, looking at your art, beholding, witnessing um, makes me want to slow down, both because of the attention to detail that you have taken from what we just optically assess and move on to like the light is like this and here's how it gradi gradates across the curved surface of an apple or whatever it is you're, you're painting. To have that meticulous attention requires presence. And when I see what you create, I think like I can be slower. What am I missing in my life? There's probably something that I'm, I'm missing. You have a picture, I think of a hummingbird that I really love, the mid flight just like stopped. And I feel like it's that moment. I feel like my, my house is so busy sometimes and my kids are so loud and there's oatmeal flung all over the floor, hypothetically. And there's just so much going on. But the stillness of a hummingbird that you know is going a million miles an hour helps me appreciate my people and my home and my exact moment of my life even more. So if you were to prep people who are coming into your world, into a gallery, the Tyler Swain Gallery, um, ready to to witness your artwork, what would be like the one sentence prep you'd give them so that they can have the most fulfilling experience with your art? Oh, that's a, I've never been asked that kind of a question before. Let me think. I, you know, I guess I'll just say the first thing that comes to mind is to, uh, to take your time with the painting. Mm. Don't, don't try to rush through it. Cause there's so much to see. If you see something on your phone, the phones are awesome, but it's kind of too bad that we see a lot of the a lot of people's creations, artwork, uh, content. We see it on like a little four inch screen. It really it's just not the same. You know, when people see art in person that then that they've seen on their phone before, it's a completely different experience. I agree. So I, I guess if I were, you know, if people were like lined up to go see my show in one of my galleries and I got a minute to prep them, like you say probably just say, yeah, take, take your time with each painting. Don't, don't try to just rush through and, and maybe you'll find something that surprises you. The invitation to surprise. That's compelling. That's so compelling. Yeah. <sighs> okay. When you see art in person, now my brain is thinking about this. Like when I've seen art, when I've gone to art shows and galas and even just been at restaurants that have beautiful artwork in them, it is a 3D experience. You want to touch them. And of course, every artist is like, don't touch my paintings, but we can pretend in our minds we won't touch anybody's paintings in the, in the gallery. But the 3D element to see the evidence of humanity on a, on a piece of canvas or wood or whatever it is, is so beautiful to me. It's evidence of life. And that life is a gift from the artist, from you, Tyler, to the rest of the world via paint as the medium, <laughs> the delivery. Such a great invitation. Okay, so if people want to see you in real life, where do they go? Like, where are your, art, Where's your art right now? My art is all over the place. Um, I'm going to try to not leave any of these out. So I've got galleries in Bend, Oregon. Tala, what? I love Bend. Where else? Um, Sorry, keep going. <laughs> It's such a beautiful town. I, I love it. It really is. Um, so Bend, Oregon, Whitefish, Montana, Big Fork, Montana, Salt Lake City, Scottsdale, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, Santa Fe, Charleston, South Carolina, and Statesville, North Carolina. And I think that's all of them. I think that those are all of my family's favorite vacation spots. So if y'all want to plan a road trip with me, I'll see you there. We'll just start yeah. in the West Coast and just do a little swoop ski up to the Carolinas. Yeah. That's amazing. And online, you're on Instagram. Tyler E. Swain is your handle, correct? That's right. Yep. Okay. And then tylerswainart.com is your website, right? Correct. So you guys can go behold all of Tyler's art. And if you can see it in person, I would totally recommend you take a date night or even take a field trip with your kids and teach them how to be slow with art, to see art and to like witness it with their souls. There's nothing like in-person, live, one-of-a-kind art. Tyler, tell these fine people 
aside from the five by five canvas that you're going to be painting for me in my house of fish, uh, <laughs> which I'm yeah. so excited, and a hidden drumstick. Can I make a request? There's a hidden drumstick in there. Can that be something we do? <laughs> Why not? Yes. Okay. <laughs> how, what, what do you most produce for people? And do you work custom one-on-one -on -one with people? How can they contact you directly to hire you to make the everyday come alive in their lives? Yeah, good question. I was also going to mention too, if you want to see my paintings in real life. Yes, we do. See my studio. I live in Byron, Utah. Byron, Utah. So that's always a way too. if you want to come and see what I'm working on. Uh, okay. Hold on. You me. just said we could come see my your art studio. Has a little contact link. It's got my, yes. If you want to. I want to. Okay. Everybody yeah. we're starting at Tyler's house. We're going to Tyler's house to see his art studio. Can you tell us for one second before you give us your contact info? Yeah, Cause yeah. I don't want people to, to forget about it. Will you tell us a little bit about this space that is so inspiring to you to create art? What's your studio like? Yeah. So I've had so many weird studios over the years. I've worked in quick side note so all kinds of spaces when i worked when i was a student i had this like big old huge like 30 foot tall ceiling studio with, it was like beautiful and then i graduated and i needed a place to work so then i rented out a studio space at the back of a gallery then i helped run a gallery for a little while in logan where i had an enormous studio to work in the gallery went under and so then my studio went to the basement of that gallery and it became a pancake restaurant. So I was working in the basement of a restaurant for a while. I've just, I've been working all over the place. And then I set up kind of a, a home studio for a bit where we were uh, renting. And now I have my favorite studio of all, which is the converted garage of my home. And it's just perfect for what I need. It's just, it's like a couple steps away from the fridge in the kitchen. So it's a, uh, it's a good way to live. And, you know, I, I just kind of can go in there in my own little space and, and make art. It's great. I love that. Have your kids ever gotten into your art stuff? Oh yeah. All the time. Awesome. I usually encourage it now. Uh, yeah. So let, let me tell you my contact information. I'll tell you a little about my kids. Okay. Do that. Tell us your contact. How do we, how do we show up at your house? Who do we call? <laughs> so I, I think, oh, I need, to, I need to update my website, but I think my phone number might even be on there. Maybe it is, but it, it, whatever. You can just send me an email through, uh, there's like a contact form on the, on the website. And there's also a link on my website in the, uh, probably the representation tab, I think is what it was to all the galleries I'm in. And you can click the link and you can see what work each of those galleries has uh, in stock at the moment. Oh, cool. So, yeah. Lots of ways to see my work online. Of course, Instagram is great. You can send me a message on Instagram too. That's always good too. That's easy. So Tyler E. Swain on Instagram and tylerswainart.com. Now to okay. end us off, I'm always, I always tell my people, go make a mess. So tell us the messiest story of when your kids got into your art. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so first of all, I, I like it when my kids do art a lot. And I've, I've done a lot of paintings uh, with their drawings or their scribbles incorporated into my painting. So I've seen those. Is that what that's about? All of those are rooted in my kids' art. Because kids make the best art, in my opinion. You know, it's like there's this weird transformation when we start to think other people care what we, you know, like we start to care more about the opinions of others. It happens kind of, I don't know, like maybe third or fourth grade in, in school, you start to become more self-conscious and the artwork gets less cool. You know, I, I love kindergartners and like little, like four-year-olds, they just draw the coolest stuff and they're so uninhibited. So I have this like golden opportunity with my kids. I have two boys, uh, James and Henry. And they do like the coolest drawings and Henry will just be like, Hey dad, look, I drew a dinosaur. And it looks, first of all, nothing like a dinosaur, <laughs> which is the best thing about it. Cause it's his own, it's just like pure expression, you know? And it's just, it's awesome. Like no one could replicate a dinosaur in the way that he just did. So anyways, I, I like to take their drawings and then I, I carefully like do a paint replica of their drawing as part of my painting and then i add some like realism elements to it so it's just kind of an interesting like i don't know it's it's kind of it's got the playfulness of a kid drawing but also the careful rendering the detail of like a professional artist too so it's kind of an interesting uh mashup i guess so 
anyways, my kids do that a lot. The messiest though, is I let my kids work on my backgrounds. Sometimes I do a lot of abstracts, like shapes and colors in the backgrounds. And especially Henry these days gets really into this, but James too. I mean, they, they both have done this. Uh, I'll just like give him a paintbrush and like, okay, go ahead and splash some color on and, you know, do whatever you want to do. And they just start scrubbing and, you know, they're not careful at all about splashing paint. So, uh, yeah, they've made, they made a fair amount of mess, I would say, helping me is, with my stuff. Is there a thought that you believe in that lets you um, feel good about being around the mess? Like so many moms that are listening to this are like, oh, the mess is stressful. I have to clean it up. This is bad. Like what is the gateway thought to where you're like, their art is beautiful and original and better than mine. What's like this bridge thought? What helps you get from A to B? First of all, I'll answer the, the mess is not stressful if you have a space for it, in my opinion. So like if we were doing this on my, like in, in our living room or on my kitchen table, then I would be a basket case. I'd be like, <laughs> we're ruining all this good stuff we've got. We're going to have company over. This is no good. You know, but if you have like a dedicated space for mess making, then let it be your mess spot. You know, I like having a clean house and things in order, but my studio is an absolute just crazy, crazy place most of the time. People like to see the humanity in objects and that messiness in, in like the creation process is that humanity to me. So you mentioned like when you see art in person, you see the brush strokes and it's like, oh, that's a, that's a big glob of paint. I didn't see that on my phone, but in person, like that's a real glob of paint. I can see how their hand must have moved to put that glob of paint down and that's like we have this like connection to the human element so yeah i don't know if that answers the question but it's like the mess is part of the humanity so i think embrace it to the extent that you can handle having a little mess area in your house or whatever i love that and if we can be messy the outcome i think metaphorically is this beautiful painting where it takes mess to get to the professionally galleried piece of art and the same is for our hearts the same is for our homes the same is for our families thank you so much tyler it's been such a pleasure and thank everybody you. out there y'all go make a mess and go look up tyler we'll talk to you next week